and welcome back to EE for Everyone. Today we're going to talk about how a transistor can be used as a switch. We will center our discussion around NPN and PNP bipolar junction transistors, or BJTs. These devices are constructed of PN junctions, the same silicon construction found in a silicon diode. However, a transistor contains two of these junctions instead of one. By adding a second PN junction into the same piece of silicon, a current-controlled device can be formed. A diagram of the three doped silicon regions of an NPN transistor should appear on screen. The boundaries between these regions are the junctions. For a PNP transistor, regions with an excess of electrons are replaced with regions that have a lack of electrons. P regions, which are regions of silicon that have atoms inserted into the silicon lattice structure with less free electrons than silicon, this creates a hole where free electrons can be captured. Some p-type dopants include boron, gallium, and indium. N regions are regions of silicon with atoms inserted into the silicon lattice structure with more free electrons than silicon. This creates an extra, extra electron which will tend to come to rest in a hole in the p region of silicon. This tendency is what creates the so-called depletion region at the boundary between the p and n doped silicon. The wider this depletion region is, the more forward bias this junction will require to conduct when used as a diode. The more forward bias required, the more power will be dissipated by the diode in normal use, given the same forward current. However, the smaller this region is naturally, the less reverse bias that diode will withstand. This tendency is why Schottky diodes with a low forward voltage cannot withstand large reverse biases. The Schottky diodes that can withstand a large reverse bias will have a larger forward voltage. Requiring both will result in purchasing a relatively expensive diode due to the tighter process control required during manufacturing. Now that you've received a crash course in semiconductor physics and are likely sufficiently confused, I strongly encourage you to research these topics further. I hope that I've given you enough knowledge to be dangerous. Let's move on and look at how we can use these silicon structures to control the flow of currents when behaving as a switch. When a transistor, BJT or otherwise, is being used as a switch, there are two common configurations, often referred to as a low side switch or a high side switch. The low side switch can be seen on the left here, where the transistor is being used to connect the low side of the load to ground. A high side switch is on the right, that's being used to connect the high side of the load to the voltage rail. A voltage rail is a general term used to refer to the net where a voltage source or voltage regulator is connected. There are two voltage sources in this simulation, one to supply the voltage rail, V2, and one to produce the square wave that will drive the transistors. Notice the current limiting resistors here on the bases of the transistors. That will prevent damage to the devices Let's run the simulation and take a look at that drive signal. When I plot the drive signal, you can see that the square wave I'm using is not perfect because the voltage does not instantly change state from low to high. This is intentional. It's closer to real life and will demonstrate a few points about physical impl implementations of transistor circuits. Now I'm going to add the load current for the first load resistor, our load one. Once I add this current, you can see that the current turns on when the drive signal is high. I'll delete that trace and add the current for the PNP transistor. And you can see that the opposite is true. Here, there is current flowing when the drive signal is low, and then no current, zero milliamps, when the drive signal is high. This is a fundamental difference between the way that a PNP and NPN transistor operates. In this case, the PNP transistor is acting as our high side switch, and the NPN is acting as our low side switch. This is the most common configuration, but it's not the only way that a transistor can be used. Now, there's a critical point where the transistor would be said to act like a switch, and that's when it is saturated, or no longer acting as an amplifier with its rated gain, or HFE. I'm going to zoom in on one of these transition periods, and I think you'll be able to see what I'm talking about. 
we have to remember that this is a current controlled device, not a voltage controlled device, so the behavior would appear highly nonlinear if looked at from a voltage perspective. So to start, I'll plot the current entering the base of the low side switch as well as the current passing through the collector of the low side switch. Now I've plotted the base current in blue and the collector current in yellow. Zooming in on one of these regions where this transistor turns on, let's take a closer look. There are three key regions. This region where the transistor is first turning on and there isn't a significant amount of current flowing. Then the transistor turns on and this slope rises nearly as a multiple of the base current. This is what's usually referred to as the linear region, though it's truly quasi-linear, it's not linear. Beyond this point, where it, there's quasi-linear operation, you can see that the gain begins to level off, where adding additional base current doesn't add significantly more collector current. And this is what's considered saturation, where HFE is no longer valid. This is the mode that we want to be operating in when using the transistor as a switch, because that's where the transistor will have the lowest collector emitter voltage and be the most efficient. This is opposed to if we were wanting to use this transistor as an amplifier, which could be done by operating somewhere in the quasi-linear region and then moving our bias point up and down. There's one more thing I would like to show you, and that's the potential for something called shoot-through. Shoot-through is what can happen when creating a push-pull amplifier stage or an H-bridge configuration. Essentially, whenever a low side switch and high side switch are used in tandem to drive an output pin low or high. Notice that if I clear these traces and plot the current of both load resistors, zooming out, you can see there are these regions on each of the transition points where both transistors are conducting. Let me rearrange this circuit and uh, demonstrate this point a little more clearly. I have the circuit rearranged. There are two key differences. Now the high side switch and low side switch are connected across VCC to ground and the output goes to our load. This configuration is used not to crowbar VCC to ground, but instead to have the control to connect the load to VCC, ground, or neither. I've also reduced the current limiting resistors to 100 ohms to demonstrate the point with a little more impact. By running the simulation, now we can see the base current, or rather the load current after the drive signal is stepped, the peak in current due to cross conduction in the simulation, the circuit is undamaged. In the real world, this would likely be the same case as well, due to the fact that beta is limiting the maximum current. However, if we were using a different style of transistor, such as a MOSFET, which is voltage controlled, we could see multiple amps of current flowing in this spike instead of only 800 milliamps. In this case, if the circuit efficiency was essential, we would be consuming more power than we might expect. However, everything would probably be fine. It's just something to keep in mind because in the real world, shoot through often causes a rapid unplanned disassembly of your hard work. I had a great time discussing some of the physics of transistors and how to use them as a switch with you. If I had to guess, I've probably left you with more questions than answers, but hopefully you have the correct keywords to research the principles at play here further. If you would like me to revisit these topics in the future, let me know down below. But for now, I hope that you learned something great today, and I hope to see you again soon.